Andy Johnson. We are looking at critical race theory. Uh, disclaimer, I'm not an expert in this area, but I hope to provide just an overview, a sense of what this might be. When I first started reading about this, I had a hard time getting my head around it. So I'm a good explainer of stuff, so hopefully I can explain what this is or might be. I recommend this article by Gloria Ladson Billings. I recommend anything that she has written about critical race theory, but this really helped me understand the essence of this theory. It's talked about a lot, uh, but it's, it does, it is kind of hard to get your head around it. Now, a theory is a way to explain a set of facts. It connects different data dots. Different theories connect different data dots differently. Behavioral learning theory connects a set of dots to explain and examine learning. Constructivist learning theory, cognitive learning theory, holistic learning theory. Critical race theory connects data dots related to race as racism to help us understand and explain racial inequities, to help us understand uh, the social, economic, political, and educational systems that disadvantage some and, un and advantage others. Now, this is an uncomfortable conversation to have at times, but these are necessary conversations to have. Two common themes, and Gloria Ladson Billings helped me with this, of most critical race scholars, a regime of white supremacy and its subordination of people of color have been created and maintained in American society. And there's a bond between laws, policies, and regulations and racial power. Originated in the 70s with Derrick Bell, Alan Freeman, Richard Delgado, they were concerned with the slow pace of progress on racial reform in the United States and U.S. society. Very much like today, you wonder if we've made any progress. We have, but not nearly enough. It is slowly paced. They found, as today, that protests and marches simply appealing to the moral sensibilities, the decency, the consciousness of citizens produced smaller and fewer gains than in previous times. Yes, we had gains in the 60s. It slowed down in the 70s. It slowed down again in the 2020s. Critical race theory and education asks us to examine in our curriculum, in our courses, to examine and to address with our students in looking at the literature, the media, the education, laws, traditions, and policies. In these things, in our courses, we need to ask who gains and who's exploited, who gets the resources, who is advantaged and disadvantaged, how are marginalized populations depicted and portrayed, where do discrimination and privilege occurred, who is heard and whose voices get silenced. In our courses, K through graduate school, we must always ask these things. Some basic ideas of critical race theory. Racism is normal. It's not an aberration. It's become so normal. It's a fabric of our society. It's enmeshed, often subtle, implicit, and unseen, but it is there. It must be unmasked and exposed. If change is to incur, occur, we must examine how people of color are disadvantaged. The social forces, economic, judicial, uh, um, and educational forces that make it more difficult for people of color and easier for the privileged, those who are the majority. The voices of real people and their experiences must be heard and honored. We have to move beyond the number. Their experiences are important to help us understand the numbers. It must be put in context. In special education, they only legitimize controlled experimental research that results in numbers. Without context, the numbers are meaningless. That means we must embrace qualitative research, ethnographies, and the stories of real people. That doesn't mean we dismiss controlled experimental studies. It means instead of looking through a narrow tube, we look at all data, all knowledge.
has to do with the field of epistemology. As well, in our courses, especially when we teach history, we have to move away from a singular perspective and include the history, American history, from indigenous people's views, from all views, instead of this singular white Eurocentric, largely Christian perspective. For uh, racism, for uh, addressing racism, sweeping changes must be made. This changes in our consciousness, as well as our policies, our procedures, our laws and regulations. Now, you may not see racism. You may not be racist, you think. You may not see racism, but your brain does. This is what's called implicit bias. You may not see racism, but your policies, your laws, your guidelines, your traditions do. Your legal system does. Racism serves to reinforce and advantage those in power, advance cultural superiority, white supremacy, and those in power. It keeps them in power. Those in power seldom want to give up power, seldom want to give it up once they have it. Change will occur only when it coincides with the interests of those in power. Change will occur only when it hits the pocketbooks of those in power. Remember, they don't want to give up power. It will occur only when it threatens the political power of those in power. Advance for people of color coincides with changing economic conditions and the self-interest of those in power, which tends to be the white majority. Sympathy, moral outrage, social decency have little impact. When the athletes decided to sit out a game and it hit the owners in the pocketbook, then they began to embrace this idea of racism and moral change and change. Structural racism, political, economic, and cultural systems in which whites overwhelmingly control power and material resources, Conscious and unconscious ideas of white superiority and entitlement are widespread, and relations of white dominance and white subordination are daily reenacted across a broad array, array of institutions and social settings. That's one definition of structural racism. White cultural parochialism is a factor in reifies in racism. Cultural superiority, our parochialism is this. These are our values. This is what we think the white majority is normal. Everything that doesn't measure up to that is seen as abnormal or deficient. Other values that don't reflect our own are abnormal, deficient, deviant. People are measured by how closely their views and values match those that the white majority holds. This is called white superiority or white cultural parochialism. And then the ninth idea that racism doesn't operate to the exclusion of other forms of injustice. This intersectionality with race and disability and other forms, other marginalized populations. That brings us to discredit this this, uh, this uh, issue of analysis of race and disability, where disability and critical race theory intersect, intersectionality. It also addresses the issue of disproportionality in special education. People of color are overrepresented in special education. This is a problem, and there are forces that make that so, that disadvantage in our educational system people of color and advantage those in the majority, the, the white majority. Seven tenets of discrete disability critical race theory. Racism and ableism operate interdependently, often in un invisible ways, to uphold the notions of normalcy. This is normal, you're not it, therefore you're deviant, you're abnormal. No marginalized category or identity operates in singularity. These marginalized populations, the special ed population, there's people of color there intersecting. 
there's people of sexual orientations and women and all these things, they operate interdependently, these marginalized categories or identities. Race is a social construct used so people could categorize other people. The same with disability. It is a social construct that sets categories outside a cultural norm. This is normal, you're not it. These social constructs have material impacts, that means you don't make as much money, and psychological impacts. This fourth idea we already addressed, the voices of marginalized populations are not recognized in traditional concepts of research and of history as well. They must be heard. We must move beyond the numbers. This fallacy of numbers in coming to know, the arrogance of ignorance, the arrogance of certainty. Race and disability both operate in a legal and historical context. Both have been used to deny the humanity of groups and the rights of citizens. Gains for people labeled with disability were occur as only when they coincide with the interests of the white middle class. Again, when it coincides with the interests of those in power, then will we see change for people with disabilities. And discrete requires continued activism and resistance. We can't expect other people to give us our rights. We have to demand our rights. I say our as uh, being a person with identified as having a disability.